So I want to talk to you about what we know about optimal pre-processing methods and how we know it. Talk very quickly about the cases where microarrays really matter a lot and highlight some of the key issues in each of those. And then quickly provide some code overview and comments for you guys moving forward. So a core question that we addressed, that we talked about yesterday and didn't really address in detail is, what's the right way to process your data set? And this really clearly shows that that's an important challenge, but we still don't have an answer of how do you know what is the right way. So the Expresso function allows you to take very, very large sets of normalization methods. These are all the things that are enabled by default in Expresso. So 3, 7, 3, and 5. So if you quickly do the math in your head, you find out that there are 315 ways of processing your data using the AFI package alone. The AFI package is not the only way of doing it, and I do not recommend people process their data 315 different ways. That's a lot of work. But on the other hand, how do you even evaluate that? How do you identify this technique is better than another? There are two ways that are prevalent in the literature. One uses what we call defined data sets. A defined data set is a data set where it is actually entirely synthetic, entirely constructed. So somebody will create a, a tube, and in that tube they will put X proportion of molecule A, and two times that of molecule B, and one third of that of molecule C. And of course, they'll do this using um, robotics. So they will create an entirely synthetic sample of RNA. That, of course, means that you'll know exactly what is in that synthetic sample, and you'll be able to, to move forward readily. Alternatively, you could use something like real-time PCR or nanostring as the gold standard, as something that provides some absolute universal truth. And that's a great technique, too, because at least that's likely to represent what people would do downstream of a microarray study. But any of these other technologies have weaknesses. And so both are in the literature. Both have been looked at a number of times. And we'll focus on one particular method. This is um, a wholly defined spike in data set. So in other words, it's a data set where they created the entire thing synthetically from oligonucleotides that they synthesize themselves. So preferred analysis methods for affymetrics gene chips, two. Wait, why is this part two? Well, good question. It's part two because way back in 2005, the same group developed a preferred analysis methods for affymetrics gene chips revealed by a wholly defined control data set. So, you know, they, they varied it from wholly defined to wholly defined spike in and so forth. But they basically tried to do this five years earlier. This initial paper was controversial. I was a PhD student when this paper came out, and everybody who did microanalysis looked at the paper and found a different thing wrong with it. And there were a lot of challenges with it. Um, just to give you an idea of what was said in public, never mind what's been said in private about this, um, there are some comments here that you will rarely get. So, for example, first the spike in concentrations are unrealistically high. We demonstrate that background noise makes it harder to identify differentially expressed genes at low concentrations. We point out that the concentrations for spiked in features result in artificially high intensities. Second, a large percentage of genes are differentially expressed. This design makes the spike in very different from that used in many experiments. And the people writing this, in case you're wondering, are Raphael Irizarry, who created RMA, Leslie Cope, who wrote the AFI package, and Zijin Wu, who created um, GCRMA. So people who really, really know what they're talking about, and we're being fairly uh, uh, robustly uh, rude about it. But a better one is uh, the rebuttal from John Story. John Story created the false discovery rate adjustment. So, you know, if there was a Nobel Prize for statistics, you would win it. Um, unfortunately, serious errors are present, are evident in the Cho et al. data disproving their conclusions and implying that the data set cannot be used to validly evaluate statistical inference methods. That's not a gentle thing to say in a public rebuttal to a paper or anything like that. And uh, at conferences, much more strident things were, were said about it. So there's a couple of things that they did wrong in the first round. And five years later, the, interestingly enough, None of the authors on this paper, on the first paper, are present on the second paper, except for the senior author. 
So all of the people who were involved in the the first paper said, oh, I'm not going to try this again. But the, the PI was like, no, we can do better. I'm confident that we can do better. And so they took five years and they came up with what they called round two. So they came up with a couple of different ways of designing their study to try to make it robust and en encapsulate some of the problems. And I'm not going to go through the problems of the first study because there are a lot. It's actually almost easier to say what they did right than what they did wrong. Um, they had real challenges with having an asymmetrical sample, with having biases brought between samples so they didn't have proper independent replicates, by using concentrations that were aphysiological, by mishybridizing their arrays so there is saturation of signal intensities where there shouldn't be, and like a billion other problems. So their second attempt was much, much more rigorous. And so uh, the first thing that they did is they created a block design. And so by that, what I mean is that they created their experiment into two groups. One of which they said would have technical replicates. For each individual sample, they would have it done in triplicates. So sample E1 would be done three times alpha, beta, and gamma. However, they also had replicates that were what they called conditional. So these are closer to biological replicates. This is a technical replicate where you take the same aliquot from a tube and you repeat it on the microarray. And the only source of noise should be the microarray dependent noise, that is hybridization differences or uh, manufacturing differences. These conditional ones are more like saying we have a biological replicate where we have the difference between me taking a sample and making it today and making the same sample tomorrow and cell lines might drift over the course of a couple of days so there would be differences in um, the growth BDR concentrations like that. And then lastly, they had two separate groups, the A and the B, that differed in a reasonable number of genes. In their first study, it was like 50% of genes were differential. Here, it was something more moderate, like 10% or so. Uh, they also made some supplements. For example, they increased the number of mRNAs from, I think it was 6,000 in the first study, to 8 or 9,000. I'm actually not convinced that was a good idea. Um, these are Drosophila, I believe, that they were using, and that's not, that's a lot of genes for Drosophila to be expressed at the same time. I mean, that's a large fraction of the genome. Uh, they also used more realistic assumptions for their other data. So the first thing that they did was try a large number of analysis methods and ask which ones are capable of predicting is a gene present or absent. And they know exactly if a gene is present or absent because they put it there. So there's gold standard of whether or not this gene is there. And you'll see the analysis methods ranged from one that was basically random chance, which is kind of funny, to a kind of bulk of them that were getting an AUC, an area under the curve, which you can kind of think of as an accuracy of about 0.8. So in other words, the methods were all getting accuracies of about 75 or 80 percent at even telling you if a gene was there. And none of the methods did particularly well. You don't see some outline when our methods right up here at one, which we're getting all of these calls correct, instead you see this long tail of not so good methods and the peak of all the other methods that are clustered closely together. This is immediately fascinating. You would think that the easiest thing to do is, would be to say a gene is present or absent. And even there, there's something like 20% error. That's not a small error rate. The next thing that they did is start asking steps of the analysis pipeline matter. And so the first thing that they showed is that background correction added a lot of deviation. So if you take a look at the different background correction methods tested, and these are different replicates and different points within that, you can see a lot of variation in the accuracy from one to the other, something like 10% caused by choices in background correction. It's fascinating to see that RMA, which is the most widely used method in this study, and they said, not all that good an idea to use RMA. Let's just start looking at differential gene expression, and they produced these plots. I think the way I would phrase it after reading this paper four or five times is a little bit of a huh. Um, these are not very intuitive ways of expressing what they mean. And actually, there's been a lot of controversy about the second paper about how you ought to have been displaying the data. But the basic idea here is asking, what is the percentile accuracy, and what fraction of methods are giving 
a result that yield a certain accuracy. So for example, this is the 100th percentile, 99th, 95th, and you can see that these very, very high percentiles, uh, a small subset of methods and combinations are reaching that accuracy. And you can get a ranking of what these different methods do. So for example, the best method for normalization may identify is invariant set, where invariant set appears to have a significant advantage over other methods. By contrast, no normalization is a yellow curve hidden inside here. <laughs> it performs uh, not great, but you know, just as well as a lot of other normalizations. The purple, red, and, and light blue lines are interesting. The purple is the lowest normalization, which is absolutely standard for uh, two-color arrays, but rarely used for uh, one color. Quantile normalization, which is what RMA uses, and VSN, which is, again, rarely used for uh, two-color arrays, for one-color arrays. So there's a lot of evidence from this that there may be methods that are invented for microarrays, but not broadly applied to affymetrics arrays that would be of use here. Conclusions from this study are kind of interesting. They claim that most commonly used methods perform strongly, and that there is no single best way to analyze affymetrics microarray data. Their performance is not great. The best methods reach an 85%-ish sensitivity, a 5% false positive. So in other words, their best methods are missing 15% of the hits, 15% of differentially expressed genes. And we had a couple of questions about merging multiple methods together and only taking the common ones. This data actually goes in the other direction. It says that we have a much bigger problem about missing things than we do about having false positives, and that at any particular cutoff or method that we choose, we are going to miss more hits than we are going to have false positives. So conclusions are a bit interesting because it's the best study in the field. Clearly a lot more work is needed, but their basic conclusion is that it doesn't really matter what you use, that all of the methods are equally good. And that doesn't quite concord with what we've seen. We've seen that there are big differences. Their argument would be you are missing a different 15% and you're making a different 5% false positive and that encompasses 20% difference in the hits that you're going to have. That's basically the source of all your problems. And that's reasonable, but if you give me two gene lists which differ by 20%, I'm going to be a little bit worried about the results. And if you start to do downstream analyses like pathway analyses, 20% is enough to completely change it. So their study has some, some clear merit to it and has some truth to it, but it kind of describes the need that we have as a community to do better work in this field. And as microarrays are starting to be seen as clinical diagnostic tools, there's an increasing need for studies like this that will allow us to kind of essentially say, this is the way in which we should be analyzing these data. And that's something that's going to need to be firmly decided and established, especially for a diagnostic where it needs to be locked in and not changed from patient to patient or method to method. So, one last thing I'll say on the topic of pre-processing is, um, Optimal pre-processing methods may not exist. There is a huge amount of work in bioinformatics now to ask if we can merge multiple methods together. Um, basically, the question is, if we analyze our data using 10 different techniques, can we get a better result if we merge or integrate them? The basic strategy is to use machine learning methods to integrate the result from different pre-processing methods. Um, so there are there was a paper from my group last year, and there's a paper that I've reviewed that's in press at a good journal right now that does the same thing for different kinds of applications. And there's a lot of reason to believe that if we do it cleverly, we can integrate multiple techniques beneficially. And then instead of having to choose, we just use all of them. The right way to do that remains completely up in the air, but that's something that's likely to change in the next three or four years in the way we think about processing arrays. So, any questions about pre-processing? Okay. So, the last couple of things I want to point out is that microarrays, of course, are uh, a big, uh, big in the area of expression analysis, and that's something that is diminishing fairly rapidly, and that's something that I think we're going to see people doing less of in, in three or four years. But there's a number of areas where I actually expect microarray usage to grow. 
Um, the first one is QAQC for sequencing studies. So I'll give you a good example of this. Um, every time my lab does a sequencing study, we run a microarray to make sure that our results are reliable. It's cheaper to do that as a quality control metric than anything else. It also provides very affordable copy number profiling. There was this paper in Cell uh, about two months ago which did whole genome sequencing of about 60 prostate cancers. Whole genome sequencing, you can call copy number variations off of the whole genome sequencing. Very, very top bioinformatics group at the Broad, and yet they did not use their whole genome sequencing data to call copy numbers. They believed that the cheap SNP6 mathematics array that they used was more reliable. So in that sense, for their perspective, spend a few hundred dollars on an array, get more reliable data, not have to worry about it, not have to think about how do I do the analysis, how do I run it through the pipelines, but it's a lot more established. So there's a lot of reasons why groups are continuing to use it for copy number profiling. Similarly, for one of my large projects where we're doing 500 RNA-seq experiments, we're doing uh, a matched Affymetrix expression array with every single one, thinking that's a good QAQC, requires less RNA, and is very affordable next to the RNA-seq. Uh, another application that's growing very quickly are these custom SNV chips. So especially Illumina has this uh, ability to create, I think it's a 40 or 50,000 featured chip for about $100, $150. You can put whatever SNPs you want on that chip. You can then interrogate uh, a set of samples with it, and because it's $100, you can now start using that in routine clinical diagnostics. So PMH as a, a hospital probably sees about 10,000 patients a year. $100 times 10,000 patients, I can't do my math, is what, a uh, million dollars. So if you were able to come up with a set of 20, 30,000 SNPs that you wanted to profile on every patient, now you can do it for an entire hospital for a million dollars a year. A million dollars gets you something like 100 whole genome sequences. So there's a big advantage to being able to do these massively parallel experiments looking at lots and lots of patients. And with 10,000 patients, now you can start doing some really interesting downstream statistics. And lastly, um, for methylation studies, microarrays remain the standard. They are dramatically cheaper, dramatically cheaper than sequencing methods. And here I mean by an order of 15, 20 fold still. Um, they provide the same quality of data, at least today. And it's likely that advances in sequencing will eventually eliminate that, but I imagine that's one of the technologies that will remain array-based for a long, long time. Did anybody have any questions about the integration of arrays and sequencing or how those two things might fit together? Yeah. So two things. One, that comes down to validation. And two, I would trust the array over the RNA-seq for most things. So, for example, if a gene was going up by array and down by RNA-seq, I would immediately think to myself, the Affymetrix RNA array experiments in my lab validate 95 plus percent of our hits. The RNA-seq experiments at my institute validate 80%. So if there's an error or discordance, I think it's much more likely to be the RNA-seq. Now, there are things you find by RNA-seq that you can't find by array. Fusion proteins, weird splice variants, alternative start sites, point mutations, all those things you can't get. But for absolute abundances, especially for low-intensity genes, the arrays are much, much more accurate. So that would be the general approach, but if I really cared about that hit, I would start off by validating using real-time or nanostring or something. I'll give another example of what we use arrays for. Um, in standard whole genome sequencing studies, uh, you can use the array to genotype a million locations for an individual. Use that to update the genome, give an improved estimate of what that patient's genome looks like, and then do your whole genome sequencing relative to that up improved estimate of the genome and improve the accuracy of your alignments in your whole genome sequencing pipeline. That's one good step. Another one is to identify sample mix-ups using the array before you bother spending $10,000 on sequencing. And a third one is giving you an estimate of the uh, true positive, true negative rate of your array. 
of your sequencing relative to the array. So there's a lot of things you can do with that. Any questions about any of these applications? Okay, so let me go over the basic things that I want you guys to remember. The basic process of microarray data is to load it, pre-process it, do QA, QC, and do statistical analysis. And if you kind of keep that in mind and go from step to step, you'll be able to get through almost any of the analyses that we would be looking at. Um, there are little tricks and tips and how different things will work, but that kind of core will take you most of the way. And I want you to remember three things. First, pre-processing is very hard. Nobody knows this is the right way to do it. And if you hear somebody say to you, how did you pre-process your data? I used X. Oh, that can't be right. Then the person probably doesn't know what they're talking about. It's much more likely that they've always used a method because it worked for them a few times and blah, blah, blah. But actually, we have data sets in my lab where one pre-processing method will generate a high validation rate and another one will generate a low validation rate. And with experience and looking at the characteristics of the data, you can start to get an idea of what that'll be. And that just means seeing lots of data sets, analyzing it, starting to come up with some familiarity of what are the characteristics of good and bad data. The second thing is nothing else really matters if you've designed your experiment incorrectly. Find a statistician and talk to them over a beer for your statistical design. That is incredibly worthwhile. And one of the numbers that's on speed dial on my phone is a statistician I worked with during my PhD. And every once in a while, it'll just be like, speed dial. So, Melanie, I have a stupid question for you. If I have X and Y, can I do Z? And usually those turn out to be stupid questions. But every once in a while, the answer will be like, huh, I have no idea. And then she goes and calls somebody who's on our speed dial, and eventually an answer comes back to me that's like, well, four or five statisticians talked about it, and we think this is an unresolved problem, so why don't you try and find out and let us know what happens? And so that's really interesting because now there's an opportunity to improve statistical analysis, and it creates that communication between the two disciplines. And so finding a statistician who can be kind of a consultant or an advisor, even if they're not going to be deeply involved with your studies, is extremely valuable. Also, when you decide to do a statistical test, think really carefully about what you're asking. What is the biological question? If you can't precisely design the biological question, you'll never pick the statistical test to match it. And once you have that, you have to ask yourself, okay, I have the statistical test, but what are its assumptions and are they met? And that time thinking up front about these issues is extraordinarily worthwhile in improving the quality of your analysis and your results. And lastly, I told you on the first day, if you forget everything that I've ever said over the course of these last two days, remember, microanalysis is a pipeline, and you have to complete one step before the next. You can't skip. Or you can't go backwards and forwards. You have to say, I'm over here, and I'm going to here next, and get one step finished properly before moving on. It's the single biggest mistake I see people make, is skipping a step, or saying, oh, well, I've got something. I really want to know what the genes are. And then they'll start seeing a gene and go, oh, this gene is really interesting. And then they'll tell their supervisor, and the supervisor will get excited. And the next thing you know, there's a follow-up experiment when the QAQC wasn't done properly, and they're going to have to exclude three of the arrays that were causing this entire outlier. I've seen that happen over and over again. And it's important that you always go through one step at a time, and no matter how much your supervisor or collaborator is saying, can we see the results? Can we see the results? You say, no, we have no results yet. I'm busy trying to make sure that the data is the right quality. I often will use lines like, I can show you the results, but they're going to be wrong. Do you want to see the right results, or do you want to see things that are going to be wrong? And You know, that's a little bit mean, but it's, it's not incorrect. You want to give people results that are accurate. And so it's worth taking the time to do those upfront steps to the pipeline properly. 